Good afternoon, everyone. Greetings from Globson Business School and welcome to the Learn and Interns and Session by Mr. Bikram Dasgupta, Founder and Executive Chairman, Globson Group. Learn and Intern forms one of the major pedagogic innovations in the academic delivery system of Globson Business School. It derives its uniqueness from the self-pressure model enunciated in a series of highly participated lectures. These sessions are conducted by none other than Mr. Mikram Das Gupta, founder and executive chairman Globson Business School, who personally monitors the progress of each and every student in the area of academics, attitude, extracurricular activities, employability quotient, among many others. Keeping the above context in mind, Globson Business School not only creates industry relevant managers, but also fosters budding entrepreneurs by motivating them to use their theoretical knowledge, thoughts and imagination in formulating feasible business plans during their course of study. This year, GBS is reinventing this unique pedagogic practice through a carefully crafted iconic series that will feature thought-provoking rendezvous between Mr. Bikram Dasgupta and other eminent industry veterans from industry and academia. The first of these series will, will see Mr. Dasgupta in conversation with Mr. Anjun Malhotra, co-founder HCL Enterprise, now known as HCL Technologies, a multi-billion dollar company and chairman Magic Software about the latter's entrepreneurial journey, areas of work, achievements, advice to management students, among others. To introduce our fond Mr. BDG Sir, an alumnus of Harvard Business School and IIT Kharagpur, Mr. Bikram Dasgupta is among the early pioneers of the Indian IT industry and has witnessed the emergence of the Indian IT industry from garage startups to billion dollar behemoths. The emergence of the Indian IT industry saw the birth of first generation entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs with no family history of business enterprise. This generation was marked by their ambition and fierce determination to change the order of things. They innovated, they disrupted, and they brought in new rules into the game. They lived by their instincts. They dis Mr. Dasgupta's entrepreneurial journey is a story of such change, a story defined by its quintessential highs and lows of dreams of daring to think beyond the ordinary and his insatiable appetite of risk taking. I extend once again a warm welcome to Mr. Bikram Dasgupta and I pass it over to you, sir to take forward today's session. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good morning. And uh, under normal situation, this would have been an ideal LNI platform because for students who have joined this year, they are perhaps not aware that every time when the session starts, I take an LNI session, as it's called, uh, just early in the session as within the first 15 days. So ideally, it would have been a typical LNI session under normal circumstances. However, as I talked to all my students in the induction program day, this year, because of the environment we are going through, the first thing which came to the management of Globsin Business School in mind was how do we do more? And this how do we do more was engulfing us continuously as we all sat and discussed strategies and how to implement as the students join in. You are aware, both Rahul and I have also introduced, and maybe some other teachers have, uh, the introduction of Harvard Business School's core uh, pro products, which is integrated in, into the curriculum of Globsin Business School's PGDM. This is for the first time that uh, definitely for the East, West and South India, someone has done this. There's only one school in Western India, sorry, which has just acquired this integration 
So in India, we are only two, two business schools which are doing this or will do this. So this batch of uh, PGDM students uh, are almost pioneering this concept in this part of the country. Having done added that value, we are now going a step further. I'm also adding value to my 18-year-old LNI programs. And by adding value means I have added an iconic series here by having with me people whom I have traveled with right from my institute days into my work life and even now. The relationships with people who have been very, very successful entrepreneurs globally are phenomenal. This, because this was the period when people like us grew into business was the period when the IT revolution happened in the world. So you are, and since we were in IT, we were fortunate that a lot of IT behemoths came out in that time. And that's why I was fortunate to be with such people. Today, I would like to introduce uh, to all of you and including the friends who have come to witness this session, uh, the, uh, Arjun Malhotra. Arjun is, we used to call him Molly in IIT days. Uh, welcome, Arjun. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Arjun, uh, I, I don't know how to introduce him, but very simplistically, I think, uh, apart from the huge list of uh, things I can talk about or people talk about him. I mean, in fact, when uh, Arjun's secretary sent me the details of his profile, there were two sets of profiles. One was the elaborate one, as she said, and the other one was a brief one. The brief one itself was quite elaborate. Uh, so I just picked up the brief one because I thought balance, I knew myself. Um, but very, very simplistically, I will say that uh, Arjun, I have all, we have all tried to practice as an individual, as a successful uh, professional and as an individual, how can we, how can we be uh, fully exposed in the market, to the people, to the society, yet be totally credible? This is a combination which is very difficult because once you get fully exposed to someone, your credibility takes a little dip because you say, oh, Bikram, I know him so well. And you become a little more over friendly. If you don't know that guy at all, then even if he's not credible, you will say, uh -huh, this guy is very good. He's done a lot of stuff. But being fully exposed yet credible, I, apart from this gentleman on the screen, Arjun Malhotra, I have not met anybody else so far. And that is the biggest compliment I can give to Arjun. And I have tried to, in my own way, follow him, not so much in the business, not so much on his successes, but I have tried to trace him on his human values. And uh, that will be perhaps my first question to Arjun, but I might like to do some of the classical introduction things also. Yes, he was the co-founder co of HCL Corporation along with Shiv Nader. He started this uh, father company of IT industry. Uh, uh, when I joined HCL, HCL was 1.6 crores turnover. And today, youngsters, HCL is over $10 billion. If you do your math and you calculate the zeros and convert the rupee to dollars, you will get an idea of from where to where it has grown. And these are the kind of people, these are the kind of leaders, these are the kind of guys, visionaries who have shown the way for the for this growth because yes, some of them, they, it has been experiential growth for them. As they have learned, they applied, they learned, they applied. However, there has been a lot of other things which has happened to them where they've absorbed these changes and made their organization grow. So uh, uh, that is one part of the story. The other side of this versatile personality uh, is that Arjun was, as he was just now telling me, he was uh, IIT goalkeeper. Am I right, Arjun? Yes, I will. I'll be home for sure. IIT and the uh, advantage was, since he was so tall, I mean, the ball never slipped out of his hands. And so it was a very safe goalkeeper to have for the hostel, for the hall. We used to call halls in our case. And he was obviously this for the same or similar reason. 
he was a basketball player he played cricket he was a lefty like me so he, i i've seen him play cricket so on the sports side he is uh, also qu quite exposed himself and tried to discover himself all the way he was a brilliant student not just because he joined iit also because he won the bc roy uh, cup in iit because bc roy cup is given to the best outgoing student of the year so uh, you can now imagine the versatility of his this thing but most importantly among all these and this is what i want arjun to talk about uh, what hits the root of arjun is his simplicity is his humanness is the way he deals with people i mean there is no hierarchy in his relationship there is i don't think it ever occurs to his mind what is your designation and what kind of salary you get and he deals with people equally he looks at human beings as human beings and he looks at the problem and tries to give them a solution vis a vis their problem so i think this humanness factor cannot cannot happen uh, suddenly or it cannot happen just in college or just in work it must be much more deep rooted as as we start talking i would like arjun to uh, tell all these youngsters who are sitting here how did this come about are you conscious about it or it's generic or is it uh, parental whatever way you call it how did this extraordinary humanness and this i don't say because you made money or something it, it this i have seen this from your college days institute days so this was very much inculcated within you uh, just tell us tell all of us how, how did how did this humanness be so and you know embedded in the whole system arjun yeah thank you vikram thank you i mean for that very very kind introduction in fact the problem with introductions like that is that i can only go downhill after that so i have to apologize in advance to everyone who's on this uh, uh, call uh, you know it's i i really don't have the answer i really think that uh, values are imbibed by your parents by your grandparents by your family and by your in earlier school teachers when you're growing up and i think those are the values that you live with your whole life i've always found that when i wanted to get something done by someone even when i was younger if you treated them with a certain amount treated them you know the treated them with respect treated them like a human being uh, you were differentiated and in a way it's i was lucky because in india people have this very big social system caste system and you tend to treat people who you feel are below you either socially or by caste or whatever in a very different way you don't really treat them like human beings uh, and you know i saw that very early in life and i figured if i just had to do simple things it would make a big difference i mean i'll give you an example you know when i used to go to sell to the iits in the middle of summer it gets really hot and humid depends on which iit you are at and the only place in those days that had a refrigerator was the director's office so i would go and meet the pa to the director and ask him for a glass of cold water and with a little grumbling and reluctance the guy would give it most of the time what i do is at about 5 6 o'clock whenever you finished your work on campus and you were leaving for the day i would go back to the director's office and just say thank you to him just that you know people are not used to saying sorry and thank you in this country and so whenever i wanted let's say i wanted the director to sign a requisition for a micro 2200 in the old days i the pm would get me those 5 minutes between meetings because he remember who i was he, he wouldn't grumble he wouldn't you know and so in a way just look at the advantage you get for just being human and i think i'll give that tell everyone that if you want to really get people uh, to treat you with respect you have to treat them with respect that's the only way you get that respect if people see you only as the boss and yelling at them they might listen to you they might be scared of you but you won't get that respect and so i think that's true it's not just true at work it's true at home it's true with your servants it's true with your driver it's true with your spouse it's true with your kids it's true with everyone and so and it doesn't cost you anything to do that so i think just keep that in mind that's 
it's it's the simplest thing to do you just have to do it it's amazing how many people don't do it yeah thank you thank you i'm sure the youngsters would have benefited with this why youngsters even the people who are now in the society running families or otherwise would benefit from this very simple yet fear uh, fearful thing um, I, i'll just change tracks a little bit uh, you know in our professional life arjun and for the students i am asking this question to you uh, in our professional life when we start our professional life there is always some people who create huge impact on you and they just stay majority of the time we say that you must have a very good first boss and the first boss can really make your career and the, and the reverse at time is also true but let's talk about the good things so if there was a first boss he can give you the right kind of inputs over a period of time and you start building yourself further because you are you're fresh from college you don't know anything you're just getting to work a lot of energy so something happens with this direction like i i can tell you a little bit that my first boss uh mr v balagopalan uh, whom i have huge respect for he used to i was in british oxygen those days um he he was he created a huge impact in me just to tell you my relationship and this i'm telling the students more than arjun is just to tell you my relationship with him today uh mr balagopalan was my first boss when i was very young and uh, just first job and then after 30 years 30 30 years my son got married and mr balagopalan lives in bangalore and my son got married in calcutta mr and mrs balagopalan came all the way from bangalore to attend his wedding he was my boss for maybe 4 years i have not really taken uh you know i kept in touch with him that well i yeah, we were on and off in touch not that well but the relationship was so strong so powerful and i used to he used to always go and say if there is a tell, tell a distributor if you have any technical question he is the main guy you ask him and he take took his chair back and he used to relax he used to always push me in front and allow me to dominate the call and make things happen then on the car on our drive back he used to tell us how the call was he used to analyze and then he used to ask things like don't you think so and this kind of things he was never aggressive with me so i think arjun coming back to you that where there i'm sure there were people like this in your life who had really been impactful and i'm really referring to very early, early part of your work life uh, how did they impact you and what in them impacted you so you know it's a little different and yeah those are there are some very good uh, questions that you asked i started my life as a senior management trainee in dc so after the first year of training you normally go into one of the units dcm in their wisdom decided to get into electronics and i was probably if not the only one of the few electronics engineers in the company so i was told one year after college that either you're going to head r&d and production or you're going to head sales and marketing depending on who we find in the market so just think of it one year out of college i was running the national sales of a new product that had to come out that no one understood because it was technical i was supposed to know what it was and uh, to get people off my back i had used very technical terms like dalington pair doesn't work and you know all that stuff which they didn't have any idea what was going on but in a way it was just learning from day one uh, i did have uh, bosses yes i was uh, electronics was part of the textile division and i've got to say i did learn a lot from uh, mr jos pala thinkel and stuff more about the commercial aspects of it but the technical part i had to work with the production and r&d people uh, yes i think it's very important your boss makes a major difference in your life but i more than that what i wanted to say was you've got to learn from everyone you interact with dc was a big company so we used to interact with a whole lot of people and i'll give one short story there was uh, in dcm there were three executive directors 
there was uh, Mr. Vinay Paratram, who was the son of uh, Dr. Chalatram. There was uh, uh, Dr. Chalatram himself. Uh, uh, Vinay was the son of Dr. Bharatram. There was Chalatram Bharatram's younger brother. And there was a gentleman called B.D. Patra, who was at the same level, supposedly. He was also an executive director. Now, B.D. Patra was unimpressive personality, short, had very little color, dress sense when he, you know, wore his clothes. And so as young kids, we used to always find it funny and we used to joke about it. And, you know, the thinking was, okay, why is he at that position? He must have some inside knowledge about black money and all that nonsense that, that you know, how trainees and kids one year out of college talk. Till I got posted to his unit in Kota. He looked after the Rayon Tire Court plant. And, uh, you know, senior management trainees are treated as senior management trainees. So he comes to the guest house, he picks me up in his car, and we drive to his uh, unit. From the time we entered the gate, and there's some 8,000 people who work in that unit. From the time we entered the gate till when we got off in front of his office, which was probably a few minutes, and walked to his office, I knew why he was who he was. He knew every single worker by name. He would stop and ask the guy at the gate, your mother-in-law had that operation, is she okay? You know, I mean, by the time you got to his office, you realize that if he asked any of these people to go and kill someone tomorrow, they would do it happily. And that was my two learning. One is that it told me how important people relationships are in, a work, in business and in work and in everything else. And the second was that don't underestimate people. If they are at a certain level, or they've achieved something, there is a quality they have. And if you can't identify it, it's your problem. It's not their problem. You know, so two big learnings I got, I remember from that, is that when you see people, you tend, and if they have achieved something, they obviously have some quality. That's why they've achieved it. You, if you can't see it, it's your problem. Because they do have that quality, right? It's not that, oh, he's lucky, he's good looking and stuff. That doesn't work. I mean, sure, that is, may help, but ultimately you have to look for what is that quality. And if you like what he, that is, then you have to try and imbibe it into yourself by adding it to your personality. I think that's what you've got to do. Okay. I, I, I will, uh, see, since I happen to know you for a very long period of time, um, I have always uh, seen you or observed you or talked to you uh, wherein your academic interest has always been a, quite high. Um, not just because you were a good student or something, it's just that some people are like that. And you had told me once in a while that you wanted to do your PhD and you wanted to perhaps even get into teaching and all those kinds of things and pretty early not i'm not talking about this age uh, but you were the marketing head of dcm i don't know much but hcl because that's my interaction with you uh, hcl and not just marketing head you were virtually like you talked about this gentleman who knew so many people you also knew uh, almost everybody in HCL, in the sense I remember still your, and the students might be keen to know this, that there was this eight o'clock call, which Arjun had, where every region or branch head used to get into the call of what happened yesterday at work. And he used to make a note, and people used to ask him that I need this, I need that time HCL was very small. I mean, it was a small organization used to do that. So you were very intense, very involved uh, in the, in that, but that was a sales and marketing job where personally you were quite academic, technology, uh, wanting to do PhD kind of a person. How, how did, is it just by default or was there anything else in that? No, I come from a family that uh, uh, is, you know, like my grandfather was a scientist. He was president of the Indian Science Congress in 1954 lived in Calcutta his whole life. I was actually born and brought up in Calcutta. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, basically, you know, people like Julian Huxley have come and stayed at our house. So mm -hmm. in a way, when you're growing up in that environment, that's what you want to do. Uh, my mother was a doctor. It, it's just 
So I never thought I'd be doing anything else. I ended up uh, not pursuing my, not going abroad and doing my PhD uh, for a very simple reason. I had sort of decided who I wanted to get married to in, in my final year in college. And so I, you know, sister of a friend of mine, and I always say that's how I became an entrepreneur. Actually, at the age of 21, I took the biggest decision of my life, probably the best decision of my life. And I talked to my to-be father-in-law at that time, and he, of course, laughed and said, I can't get my daughter married to someone who doesn't have a confirmed job. So I, the decision I took was, let me get a confirmed job. Let me get married. Then let me go abroad and do my PhD, because once you're married, then no one says anything. You know, then it's a, and so, and my GRE score was quite good, so I wasn't too worried about getting a, but because VCM decided to get into electronics and I got that opportunity, I stayed back. And that's really, so, you know, the lesson is you may plan your whole life. You think you may plan your whole life, but ultimately you've got to play or you've got to plan your life with the cards you're dealt and say, what is the best thing for me to do at this particular? And that's really how. So that's the reason why I moved into sales and marketing. And because I was interested in academics, I kept up with the technology. And so when we used to sell computers, remember in the initial days, you had to talk technology and simplify it so people could understand it instead of just uh, being an R&D type person. And that really helped because when you wanted to explain to people what techno how technology solved their problem and what it would do, it helped to use a little bit of jargon and to you know look at a little bit of commercial stuff. And you you we've been on a number of sales calls together, so you know how that works. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you know, let's say till HCL got to about two three thousand people. I knew everyone by name, I knew their qualifications, I knew their degree. In fact, I still remember uh, Shiv calling me up. I was in the US uh, at Gwalior Rail's Nagda because we had some problem. I had for free upgraded their printer from a 150 LPM to a 300 lines per minute. And you remember that was just one thing you had to do in the printer. It was you know, change anything. Uh, but the maintenance had to be paid. And our record showed 150, but the maintenance guy had written 300 in his bill. And so Shiv had this thing that, and so he called me in the US and said, what's the printer number that has gone to Nagda because we have this problem. And, you know, I had it at the top of my head. I gave him the printer number and stuff like that. But that was, yeah, it's, it's just, I have a good memory. I had, I should say, it's, it's going now. But uh, that was the way it was. So you've you got to use your strengths. You've got to use your assets. Everyone has different strengths. And people remember you. People remember that, like, I don't think anyone, how should I put it? I used to ask people about uh, prospects that they had. They, so they were scared to tell me if they weren't going to get the order or it wasn't going to come on a certain day. Because then I'd follow up because I'd remember it. Or I'd put it on my little slip of paper and pull it out at that time. There was four by fours, you remember those four by fours. Yeah. Everyone has to be yeah. Everyone has to build their own technique on how to do things that get things done. And you know, that's the way it works. There is a, a supplementary question to this, because it's a, this is for particularly for youngsters listening, this will be an interesting point. Uh, many times in 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 my career and life, I have felt that R and D people and sales marketing people are in one sense similar. They are both doing speculative work. They don't know the result when they do research. They don't know whether they'll get the order when they make a sales call. So there is a certain degree of unknownness with both these uh, fa faculties are working at any point of time. Otherwise, uh, uh, sales is always looking at the future and hope and you know trying to trying to get things moving for themselves and then targets and all that r and d is more in that sense state this connectivity between sales and r and d uh, at times has has had miserable failures and there have been people who have come from r and d into sales and they have not really understood what's going on i mean uh, I mean, these kind of things. 
rather than going to the customer and solving the problem. So I think, could, would you like to comment on this? That was there anything else which perhaps requires to be a person who is not in that direct faculty to develop uh, certain instincts within him, which common sense is, of course, one. I mean, there's no doubt. Intelligence is one. But is there anything else you can throw light on? So, you know, it's, it's a very valid point. Uh, I mean, I know a lot of engineers uh, in the US, for example, who have a great idea for a product. And they feel that I'll make this great product and the world should line up to buy it from me. You and I know that doesn't happen. Uh, the best product doesn't always, isn't always what gets sold, right? So there's this whole go to market, how to position it in the market are very important things that most technical people don't understand, right? So basically what you've got to do, it's also why technical people, I, let's talk about lawyers. When you give a lawyer a document that you want, you want to do an agreement with someone, the lawyer will give you just the legal viewpoints. What you don't, I mean, I always say that their job is to tell you how you can't do it. I want to know how I can do it. So give me my risk factor. And let me assess it. I'm the person who's got to take the risk. You, Mr. Lawyer, are not. I mean, we'll come to you if we run into a problem. But that risk assessment has to be mine as the manager. Right. That's true in R&D. That's true in, in marketing. That's true in sales. But I think when you go for, when you're going for sales, you can prepare yourself better. Know your customer. Know what they're doing. Try and know the individuals who are in the decision, I mean, I don't have to tell you this, you know this, in the decision cycle, and try and say, what's the value proposition you're going to give the customer? And I have one simple rule. I try to be honest with my customer. So then the next time I don't have to worry about what did I tell him last time? Yeah. Right. Because if you told him something that was not honest, then you better note it down somewhere because you have to repeat it. Otherwise you lose credibility with the customer. But if you're honest, then you and sometimes you do, you know, you come on and production tells you I'll deliver in six weeks. You tell the customer six weeks, something happens, six weeks go through 10 weeks, go back to the customer and say, I'm sorry, you know, he and if he knows that you're being honest, he'll accept that. Otherwise, he'll think you were fooling him when you said six weeks and you were doing it purposely. So again, that's a simple lesson I learned is just be honest with your customers, be honest with your employees. Be honest with everyone. In fact, I think uh, I get away with a lot of things because people think I'm fair. You know, and fairness is a very important thing. And if people think you're fair, they will take a decision that they don't like from you and accept it without, I mean, they're obviously upset that you took a decision which they didn't like, but they'll accept it. And that I found very useful. So I try to stay with those values. Basically, it's values. Ultimately, people look at you. What you talked about also is a set of value systems. Yeah. People have to define their values, and you have to live with your values. You know, you have to walk the talk, as Gandhi said. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I will now come on to HCL a little bit. Uh, I, I've I have worked in HCL for about five years. Uh, that was very early days in my life, and in fact, you hired me if you remember when I met you first, just to uh, you know, scratch your brain was uh, that you, I sat in the interview room and in the final interview and you asked me that uh, Arpi Hall? I said yes. Then he took your left hand up and said TT. I, I very clearly remember I used to play table tennis. Yeah, yeah. I used to play table tennis and you remembered that. That was a recall you had. Uh, and then HCL of course. A lot of things happened in HCL for me. Uh, my question is a little different. My question is that we all know HCL as a Jogadi company. But let's go back to those days. I mean, pre-HP, let's shall we say. Very Jogadi days, always fighting for collections, always trying to cross the you know, border, going to the next level, and pushing, pushing, pushing. This was the kind of uh, company character which HCL created. But HCL also brought in huge amount of innovated innovation in technology, new things they did. They did a lot of things, not only in uh, lease financing, but also in pure product, the introdu introduction of product well thought of. 
and it, it came in together and that's why HCL succeeded. I mean, not just the Jogadi part of HCL. So I think uh, this combination, what was the core of HCL? Was it changing lives of people? Was it technology? Was it innovation? What was the core of HCL? You know, I think one of the nice things about HCL is everyone played their role fairly clearly. So Shiv's role was finance and, you know, getting, as you said, new leasing schemes and stuff and managing the cash flow. <coughs> Excuse me. Raman's role was R&D and production. Right. My role was sales and marketing. And you've, been, you've seen the fights we used to have, have all the time on stuff. But the whole idea was that I would try and push them to try and give me what I needed. They would try and push me to try and act, work within the boundaries that they had and the limitations they felt they had in their areas. And I think we all were pushing the limits all the time with each other and within our areas of expertise. In fact, one of the things I know we try to inculcate in our salespeople is that I want 100% market share. I don't accept anything less than that. So every order you lose, we would spend more time discussing why it happened, what happened, etc. Then actually, and the whole office would know about it. So you didn't want to come back to office if you lost an order. That's how it used. That's the culture that we had. And the culture was the whole world is against me. I am against all the other competitors. They all, and really, if you remember what used to happen was people wanted to get HCL out of the picture and then negotiate amongst themselves. And so all of a sudden you felt you were the, you know, you were the one that had to fight the rest of the world. And that was the culture. And again, it's a question of, you know, starting companies is like getting up children. In the first few years, you define the culture, you set it up. And then it goes on beyond that, because after a while you don't, you know, you're not spending that much time with the front end person anymore. Your managers are spending time and yep. they have to inculcate. So if you inculcate it in them, they will inculcate it on. And that's really how it, how it sort of works. Yeah, but uh, I, yeah, sorry. The other thing I used to, my, my rule is I don't ask someone to do something that I won't do myself. If they say, no, they can't do it. Then I used to go and do it myself. And that used to make a lot of people feel bad, ashamed, whatever word you want to use. And so very rarely people said no. I mean, unless they had a genuine reason and they then give that reason. They won't say no because they didn't want to travel or they didn't want to do this. Or I don't have a train ticket. I don't have a reservation. I don't think you ever heard that excuse from anyone in India that I can't go to Gorakhpur tomorrow because I don't have a reservation. That was just, yeah, it didn't happen. Not in, not in HCL, no, and not even in PCL. So I think uh, now I come to these three companies, which has been almost an enigma to me. I mean, there was this company called HCL, which I just talked about. Then there was Wipro. Now Wipro uh, was a company which I used to in the market, when I used to compete with Wipro from PCL side, I used to always say they are a classical number two company. They're classical second position company. They will be very happy being a runner's up. They will not, but they will be runner's up. They will ensure that they're runner's up. They're not third also. So being second was a great thing for Wipro. And this is how I should handle competition. And that was a competitive flavor, but whatever, it was a much more organized than HCL, delivered on time, you know, very, very classical kind of company. So for HCL to beat Wipro, in that sense, was relatively easy. Wipro was a lot more predictable in, in terms of what they will do or perhaps what they will not do. Then walked in this company called PCL. And HCL actually did not know how to handle them. I mean, this, this is our feeling. I could be wrong. But they were just taking everybody out of place uh, suddenly. And whatever HCL was doing, PCL was doing. Whatever Wipro was doing, PCL was doing. So there was no way um, this competitor, which was a tiny guy, for, for a long time, competitors kept PCL at bay by saying, oh, they're too small. They're not uh, worth considering. But you can't keep a competitor like that for long. And it was built on the spirit of HCL in terms of the kind of thing you just now said. But there was a difference. There was a difference in PCL and HCL. How do you, how do you as a, 
as a person today now, as a wise man today, how do you summarize these three companies those days? So actually, you've got to get a little background of what was happening in the computer industry. Yeah. So how did Wipro come in? I think that was one of HCL's biggest mistakes. We got to a point where we thought we could tell the market what it wanted. And, you know, the market needed and the need was a batch processing machine. So we made a 16 bit machine, the system four great machine, but the market wanted multi terminal and Wipro got imported this multi terminal machine, which they came out with, which technically performance wise was nowhere close to what we had, but that was what the market wanted. And we allowed them to sort of in a way through that mistake where we thought we knew we could tell the market what it wanted. And I thought kids should learn this lesson that you can't tell the market. You may think it's illogical. You may think it's what fashion, whatever you call it, but you have to listen to the market. Otherwise, it doesn't matter who you are, you'll fall on your face. That's how Wipro came into the market and became what they were. What happened with PCL is somewhat similar. HCL grew in the first time user market very aggressively. But then we felt we were vacating because Wipro had stepped into the corporate market much faster than we had. We thought we were vacating that market. So we shifted our focus nearly completely to the corporate market. And PCL walked into that first time user market, which was really open. If you remember, that's really what happened. And once you're established in the market, then you can play, you know, you can grow and do your own things. And yes, it was interesting. But the nice thing about having competition is that it improves everyone and the better ones survive and the poorer ones die. So in a way, I think competition is really good. I think having uh, multiple players in the market uh, who are actually competing with each other tends to be really good. What got a lot of people in HCL upset was the whole PCL team was ex HCL. And so that seemed to get them correct. correct. You know, that was the way it was. Although the entire NIIT team was also ex HCL, in yes. the last part of it at least. But uh, there, because they were in a completely different business, we weren't directly competing, right? Uh, in fact, if you remember, I got into a lot of flack because technically, uh, Dagan Bhai, who, the late Dagan Bhai, who was the sort of CEO of PCL, and I, we were together in college, we were really good friends. I'd even invested some money with him. And so I was sort of considered a, for a while, uh, everyone was confused of what my role was in that whole thing. And, you know, I had to do some, I, well, I had to step very carefully in terms of what I said and what I didn't say, because uh, you, know, you know how it is in the field. And, yeah, 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 I know it all. <laughs> Yeah, that was a very interesting phase, even of my life. Uh, uh, and that brings me to Dadan Bhai a little bit, because I think our discussion between you and me and the younger uh, crowd and keeping them in mind, we can you can respond to this, that Dadan Bhai himself was an enigma. I mean, that he was a completely, uh, he was the kind of person I have not met or seen those, that kind of personality after Dadan Bhai. Uh, just to give an example to the students, he had all his buttons open all the time. He never combed his hair. Uh, Arjun will give you more specifics. I think he did his undergraduate at a at very, very early age, from 13 or 14 years, some 15 years. He was from Bihar. Their feudalistic society was absolutely 10 out of 10. And Dadan used to tell stories to me that when, uh, when, when his dad used to get out of his house, the person across the road who just happened to be a cobbler, the people were sent from his house to see that he's not around visible anywhere because the Brahmin is getting out of the house. So he has to be cleaned up completely, not in, in vision. So that is the society with which he was born and brought up. And Arjun will tell you, he was, he was a crazy guy to say the least. But not once he was crazy in the sense of being mad or something. He was he was a successful person in his own right. I've learned a lot from Dadan. And at this stage of my life, I'm 
I want to acknowledge this, that he's one person who's taught me a lot. He has taught me to be free. That's one thing. Then he said, what kya hoga? Galti hoga na? That's all. So he's, he's, uh, there was a story here. This is for the first year students. And I don't, I, Arjun, keep quiet to listen to this. And then I'll come back to you uh, because it involves your uh, issues. When I came to know from the uh, head of HR of HCL that uh, it has been decided. Mark my words, it has been decided that I can't join PCL from HCL. Uh, whoever is empowered to take the decision has taken that decision. So now it's you should look for a job. That time, not only I had joined, I was joining uh, uh, with equity as a shareholder in PCL, how, no matter how big or small it was. And I was very much entrenched as a partner concept in building PCL. That is the whole reason I was joining PCL, that it gives me an opportunity to build a computer company. And it was the date of joining was decided. Everything was decided. And I, I remember my wife selling her ornaments to pay for the equity. I mean, a, as detailed as that, these youngsters will not understand. But it doesn't matter. It was so passionate. Uh, and suddenly this guy comes in the night and says, you look for a job. And you can't join HCL. So I went back to my bedroom and I, my wife was also with me. It was a winter uh, evening. And then uh, uh, I told my wife, what do I do? So then I, I knew that Dadan is not in town. But I also knew he's coming the next day back. So when the morning came, I went to Dadan's wife, Chitra's office. Chitra used to work for Bank of India. And uh, I went to, and she was also a very dear friend as Arjun's wife Kiran is. Um, so we went to um, Chitra and I told her, I was so worried that I told Chitra, now what's going to happen to me? I mean, this guy says, and you know who is telling this, so it's, it'll not change, it'll stay like that. So Chitra laughed, he smiled, she smiled and she said, Dadan, to sham ko aara hai, baat kar lenge. So I said, he's sham ko aara hai, but how do I reach the evening? I mean, it was that situation for me. Then he said, you come in the evening to the airport, I'll come with you, Chitra said. And what I'll do is, I will be behind you. And Dadan should not be able to see me. So when you approach Dadan from the airport and he's walking out, uh, and you tell him this, I want to see his face. Just once I want to see his face. I also want to understand my husband. This is exactly what she, she's told me. So don't worry, I will not come in front, you be there. I, let me see what Dadan, how Dadan reacts. So I went to the airport and Dadan is a typical Dadan. He was singing and moving, you know, like this, like this. And he was coming <laughs> with his baggage. And he used to call me Das Gupta Set, you know, in, in his typical style. So he suddenly he saw me, he said, oh, Das Gupta Set, what are you doing here at the airport? I said, I've come to re receive you. So receive me for what? So they said, baat karna hai. So kya baat karna hai? Bolo, bolo. Then I took him aside and I told him my horror story. Then he had a big laugh. This was his first reaction, big laugh. And Dadan at times, permit me to say Arjun, that Dadan at times used to use some unparliamentary language. And that was his US, that was his USP actually. <laughs> but no matter what, it was very natural on him to talk like that. So he used some of those and then he said, Deko Das Gupta said, you and me have decided to work together. You and me will work together to hell with everyone else. He didn't say to hell, he used some other, his lingo to say, but whatever it is, it meant that. That is it, you're time waste kar hai par. You're just wasting your time. And he just said, jao, jao, ghar jao. So he just sent me home. Now this was a character, which is why I'm bringing this in front of these youngsters. This was a character, a phenomenal person, phenomenal character. I would like a very close friend of Arjun. I remember once we lost a business in DPS in Calcutta. Arjun and me were on the call. And DPS was very upset with Dadan because of the way he has dealt with them. And he told Arjun, if this guy is handling your account, then we can't do, give business to HCL. Arjun just got up and said, then. Perhaps we can't do business. 
because Arjun Dadan is a friend of mine. That's it. Full stop. So while he didn't say what was Dadan to him, this, this example gives you an idea how you respect friendship and you respect values in your, in your relationships. So Arjun, just quickly in two minutes, can you tell these youngsters about Arjun? How about Dadan? Sorry. Yeah, so Dada and actually we are together for five years in IIT. We are the same hall. Uh, in fact, he did his, you're right, he did his BSc at the age of 13. 13. He, uh, sorry, at the age of 15. He did his higher secondary with the first division at the age of 13. He taught for one year at Maharaja College in Hara in Patna. And he then joined IIT. And because his family had a large farm, he was, I think his rank in the IIT entrance exam was 630 or something. And he chose agricultural engineering. I don't think there's anyone ever who's chosen agricultural engineering with a lower rank. Right? But uh, he realized, I think, a day or two after coming to IIT that all of us were fresh out of school. And he was a BSc. So the next thing you knew was outside his room, there was a sign, a plastic sign that said, doesn't buy BSc. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he was a great. So Dadan was, how do I put it? You know, people take risks. So, you know, when I'm when I'm taking a risk with an area that I'm comfortable with, I might take an 80% gamble. If I'm taking a risk with an area I don't know, I might take a 20, 30, maybe a 40% gamble. Dadan was willing to take a 90 plus percent gamble on nearly everything that he did. You know, so I just don't know how to describe him. I think he was born in the wrong country at the wrong time. If he was born in the US and he had lived there, he would have been a multi-billionaire today. Because that was the kind of person he was. I don't think he ever thought within the box. He only thought outside the box. And so, you know, when he had to, I mean, the other story I remember is there was another uh, head of marketing, the late Amit Dutta Gupta in HCL. He called him over once to give a presentation at Bhuvneshwar. So Amit flew uh, you know, to Calcutta in the evening flight and then he put him in a taxi and they were all driving overnight to Bhavneshwar. And Dadan was explaining what had to be done, the presentation. And uh, Amit said, but you know, why did you need me for this? You guys could have done this presentation on your own. And I still remember, Dadan told him, no, we need you because you're good English. And you know, of course, Amit <laughs> was <one of> characters. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, that was the kind of person yeah. he was. It, it was very difficult to get upset. You, Even if you were upset with him, it was very difficult to get upset with him. Yeah. yeah. Uh, True. Okay, we shift gears now. I think we, uh, we will now go towards more focused on, to some degree on today. And what is going through the minds of these youngsters who are sitting today. And... Uh, one thing I told them on the induction day is uh, you're going to graduate, you're going to pass out uh, in 2022. And this is 2020. So it's the time you get out and start your professional life. It'll be two years from now. And we always, we talk how long COVID will last September, November, January, like that. So it's, it, there is some time in it, but Arjun, I want you to comment and tell these youngsters to some degree, whatever input you have or value you have on this, is how does one, I'll put two questions together so that you can answer them together. How, how does one prepare for an eventuality like this? And how does one fight? How does one be relevant? And how does one be aggressive? And how does one prepare himself or herself, as they see a very open future in front of them, why they, even their seniors don't know the future. So I think there is a problem in seniors telling them, this is the direction you should go, or that is the direction you should go. So it's a very unique kind of a situation. They can only take wisdom, and they can only uh, go by the wisdom we can give them. So I would like you to make some comments on this for them, purely for the business school students, mainly for them, and so that they can keep this in mind and they can be serious. Because I keep telling the business school students that MBA is a two-year internship program. It is not a postgraduate program. So you intern here 
we call it students and studies and all that but you're preparing yourself in these two years to go for the future and your life and your career so some some thoughts on this so you know first thing i want to tell everyone and you know fortunately for us in the it industry it's been true that uh, learning is a lifelong experience for us technology forces us to keep learning all the time I mean, the technology we started off with, the technologies that are there today, the technologies that are likely to be there tomorrow are going to be very different. And so in IT, unfortunately, it, you have to keep learning. Otherwise, your history. What has happened is, what is happening today is that in whatever industry you are, this is applicable. So, you know, if you think by doing a two-year program, I'm now knowledgeable, I know what's going on, please change your thinking. You have to keep learning. Now, whether the learning is in your management, whether the learning is in the industry you go into or whatever, you have to keep learning, number one. Number two, better get used to working with data. You know, with IoT and stuff like that coming up, the amount of data that's going to be available for people to take decisions is going to go up multifold. And the data is not just going to be numbers or text. It's going to be voice. It's going to be video. And so any business you're in, you know, probably the sexiest job today you can get in for of a data scientist. And a data scientist is someone who understands the data, knows a fair amount of math, and uh, uh, does, understands the industry. So you can't be one or the other, right? But the third thing that you want to look at, and which is, you know, what we are in today, is this whole COVID situation. Now, it's anyone's guess when it will go away. But I think most people are very comfortable that in two years it will definitely not be there the way it is today. Hopefully it will be gone by the middle of next year. But again, who knows? But the key to remember is that it's going to change the way we look at a lot of things. I mean, today we are doing this online uh, kind of talk. Now think of education. If we have to do online education for higher education for a year, I'll just give that as an example. Think of what's going to happen, right? Why would, let, let's start with the first point. Once we know that we, why would I pay that kind of money to send a person to live on campus and blah, blah, blah. Why would I not do it all online? And if I'm doing it online, what stops a IIT or an MIT or a Harvard from having 2 million students online? And then why would small universities, how are they going to survive? Right. Third thing, look at it. If content has to be digitally done, why would I depend on expensive American professors when I can get much cheaper people in India or countries like India to do it? So just think of what's going to happen to the higher education industry as an industry as this pandemic changes the way people think. And it's going to happen to every industry. Right. I just tried to give you an example that you all might be directly familiar with. But whatever your industry, it's going to change. So in your mind, you've got to think of which industries are going to have to take advantage, can take advantage of this, which industries are going to have to adapt, healthcare being a good example, where on you know telemedicine, online healthcare is going to suddenly become much more important. From under 10%, it's going to go to 40, 50, maybe more uh, percent of people who will do it. How is it going to impact doctors, hospitals, you know, the whole system. And then there are the industries like public transport, industries like hotels, you know, where the impact is going to be negative. People are going to be not wanting to be in a crowd even after this thing goes away, right? So just think of what, quote unquote, they call the new normal is going to be. And it's going to be a new normal. And so I think you've got to look at, and we can you can read, there's a lot of material coming out. It's changing every day. But it's worth reading to see which industries are going to go in which direction. Now, you have the opportunity for you is phenomenal. Number one, if you want to go into an industry, you can choose the industries that you think are going to be winners. You decide you want to play a more, uh, how should I put it, evolving role. You, <clears throat> you want to influence change, go into industries that are going to be struggling to change. It's exactly what happened to books when Amazon and all came out. What happened to uh, travel or airlines 
when uh, internet came out, just see how the whole thing changed. So, you know, you, I mean, the opportunity is phenomenal for you today when you look at graduating a year or two years later, because you don't, you can decide what you want to do, how aggressive an industry you want to go, how secure an industry you want to go. Even the government, for example, which is considered a very secure job, is going into e-governance in a very big way. In fact, I think the Delhi government, uh, and I'm a little biased because it's headed the chief ministers from IIT Kharagpur, but they are doing they are doing a lot of very interesting work that other governments are emulating today. And so, have a look at you know how governments are going to go in the future. Are they going to govern the same way? While the IAS might desperately want it to happen that way, it has to change. Technology is going to force this change, right? What it's also forcing is normally look at AIDS. AIDS have been around for five, ten years, long time. I still don't have a vaccine for AIDS. Yet for uh, COVID, they're talking of getting out a vaccine in a year. So what they've done is they've compressed all these processes, and there are lots of people who think that they're not doing it right and they're doing it too early and they shouldn't be doing it. But what choice do they have, right? Think of how, think, look at the different uh, vaccines in COVID. Look at the different ones. There are the traditional ones. Then there are the genetic ones that are coming out. And look at what genetics and this whole biotechnology is going to do to the healthcare industry. Just think of what is going to happen. I mean, I wish I was your age. Uh, it would be a very interesting place to reflect. Fortunately, the IT industry was at that stage as Vikram mentioned when we were your age now. A little older than you. That's going to happen to biotechnology when you get to about 2025. 20, oh, it's happening now, in fact. And when you get to 30, it's going to happen to nanotechnology. So you're going to have to learn and relearn. You know, in our case, people are becoming redundant at the age of 50 plus because technologies are coming. In your generation, if you don't catch up with technologies, you'll be redundant at the age of 30 because a new technology will come in and start ruling the world. So just remember, it is a very dynamic world you're going to be living in. And technology is going to change our life. Everything is going to, some technology, <coughs> excuse me. And uh, IT, fortunately, is the core infrastructure on which these technologies are going. Whether you look at biotechnology or nano, IT is the base on which it's all happening. And so, you know, everyone has to be, a, I mean, you have to know your IT doesn't matter where you work, basically. Yeah, so I, I just uh, want to uh, take an extended role in this. Let's look at the management side now, in the sense of people who will manage people, govern the organization, head departments. So there's a behavioral aspect of uh, which they have to keep in mind in the post-COVID era. And then there's leadership, then there is a learning going on there. So how does that part of the change in the new normal uh, happen or how the tech, just pure vertical learning area is one part. I mean, what needs to learn, look at the market, try it, work that. What about the horizontal part of the learning, which is the behavioral part of it? You know, that people are still people. That's not going to change. Yes, some things are going to change about masks and maintaining distance and office hygiene and, you know, blah, blah, blah. That's all going to change. How you deal with people, no longer do you hug them. You know, now you do fist pumps, you know, all that stuff will stay for a while. And of course, namaste is going to come back again in a global way. But other than that, people are people. They are the same. Yes, you deal with a higher level of fear. You deal with a higher level of paranoia with this pandemic. It's not going to go away overnight. But people are the same. Ultimately, you have to deal with them the way we deal with them today. So to that extent, you know, I mean, the basics never change. Your values don't change. Yeah. Your corruption is going to be corruption. It's not going to say, you're not going to say that, hey, if it's less than 1,000 rupees, it's not corruption. If it's 1,001, it's corruption. I mean, it's one rupee, it's corruption. So some values have to stay the same, right, basically. And uh, you have to, I think, you have to start simplifying your life as students. As you go into life, you come up with a lot of problems. And if you let them overwhelm you, you're going to be in big trouble. 
and so you have to look at what you can see today because there prob there'll be problems you can't see today that will come at you and try and say how do i simplify this and so i'll give you one example that i follow so you know if you're in a country like india or in a lot of countries even in the us for that matter corruption is an issue and when you're doing sales and you're doing business uh, they're going to be people who will want kickbacks they you know all that stuff happens now you have to decide what you want to do you know and according to me most people when they graduate from college are idealistic you want to change the world you want to do the right things you want to do everything right now i decided very early in life that i wanted to keep those principles i thought they were important to me as a person and that if i wanted to like myself as a person i had to keep those principles uh, and maintain them and you know i specifically mentioned that corruption because that's something that comes up all the time and you have to face it and decide how you're going to handle it and so i simplified my life by saying i'm going to ask myself three questions and if the answer to all the questions is yes then i'll go ahead and do whatever i think is in the gray area so to say so the first question i ask myself is by my conscience am i doing the right thing and if i feel yes i'm doing the right thing then i ask myself the second question which is is it okay for my family to know about this and if the answer to that is yes then i ask myself the third question is it okay to read about this in the morning newspapers tomorrow and if the answer to that is yes then i go ahead and do it because what, what am i worried about i don't worry what the world thinks i don't worry if my family knows about it and i think i'm doing the right thing so that is in a way simplified my life and as i tell people that you know if you can think of problems that are going to come up that you want to solve try and give yourself a simple kind of three question maybe a little more complicated than that type of equation that makes it easy for you and so you don't you will still have a dilemma that happens to everyone but that's another the other thing i do is and uh, my wife thinks i'm a machine because i do it is that i try not to i try not to worry about something if worry doesn't change the outcome of what i'm worrying about i try if there is something that is worrisome i try and look at solutions alternative solutions to that problem rather than worry about it now we are all emotional we are human beings we definitely have to worry a little bit i mean i can't take that away from your psyche but <clears throat> to me that's not the thing i try not to worry about it i try to think of alternative solutions and again i'll tell you you know worry is bad for your stress it's bad for your blood pressure and as you get into more and more business and more and more work worry becomes an important part of what you're doing and so try not to worry about it try and look at look for the solutions try and look for what are the alternatives you have to solve that problem yeah solve it for you so why worry that's how i look at it maybe that's because i am a machine as my wife puts it i am an engineer or whatever but that's So those are simple things that I wanted to say. They went, they're not easy to do, but they're something that we should try. Thank you, thank you, Arjun. I think uh, uh, almost towards the end of our uh, session, uh, what comes out as I was thinking, uh, as Arjun was talking, and I was also sharing, and I'm my mind is completely. I'm looking at the face of those youngsters who are. uh just come to join globes in business school uh and uh, what are they thinking and when they go back home or they are at home currently what do they think when they are alone uh and i was trying to see whether we can raise any such issues what they are thinking so that they get some direction some thought so uh, youngsters one thing which comes out in, from our discussion and maybe that's the take away uh which you can go with as far as i'm concerned is two things we kept on repeating one is think the those days of doing things without thinking are perhaps getting over so think second is and this is hugely relevant for all of you is read 
I'm doing a lot of reading these days and I can tell you, I'm getting a lot of research data, correct information, what others are doing. When I read, it is not necessary, I'll follow that. But I get data, I get information. I understand what others are doing or trying to do or thinking of doing. I can then take a more mature decision. A part of this reading, and mark my words here, part of this reading we used to do earlier by meeting people, by sharing face to face with our Adda sessions and things like that. Since that is missing today to some degree, reading has taken a center stage. Because if you read, all kinds of things are coming out today, all kinds of things. And if you, if you, if you just tell yourself one hour a day to start with, I will just read anything you want to read. I've seen questions here and I want to tell people who have raised questions and we couldn't answer directly that uh, we will get back to you with those questions answered because we'll have the data about you here. And some of those questions which you raised is relevant, but I think we have covered it in a different way. But many of those things you have raised are available through reading. If you spend a lot of time on research, a lot of time on what's happening in the world, and you have a lovely thing called uh, the laptop or the computer or the mobile with you, and invest in yourself to read. Because if you read, then you can think. So if that, you follow that sequence of reading and then thinking, and then once you do that, then you come out, look up the air, look up to the sky and say, hey, that makes sense. Why, why can't I do it? It's your life. Now, today, since you're, since you're missing the, you know, as Arjun said, you know, hugging each other and doing all those physical activities, uh, I guess it's a blessing in disguise in a way that you are having an opportunity to be with yourself and spend more quality time for your vertical growth and self-developmental process. And that you can do it yourself. You don't have to go anywhere else. So I think that's the takeaway which I would like uh, you to have today. Uh, Arjun, thank you so much. Uh, not, at all, not at all. I just wanted to, yeah, I just wanted to leave two points. One is that try and learn how to relax, meditate or whatever, because over a period of time, the fact that you can get yourself to relax will reduce your stress. And the other thing is, try and be a, the kind of human being where you like yourself as a person. Now, you decide what you like as a person and try and be that kind of human being. I think those ultimately, everyone, you know, your value system shows it doesn't matter what you're doing, especially as, as you get into management and you guys are doing an MBA. It's your value system that will show to your peers, to your boss, and when you're a boss, to the people who work with you. So it's very important that you be the kind of person where you like yourself. Okay. I just want to leave those two bits. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, so thank you very much, Arjun. And I think we had a wonderful time. And this is the first of our iconic series, very well organized by uh, the, our team, uh, digital team here. I would like to convey my thanks to them. And thank you, students and the other guests who had come to listen to us. Please send in your requests for such webinar sessions. I will have under L and I a specific series where I'll get in seniors who will come in who are otherwise my friends or but successful entrepreneurs, successful executives who will come and share their wisdom and value uh, to a mixed crowd, essentially for the students but also we will have it open as a webinar like we did today. So thanks a lot and stay well, stay safe and be happy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Everybody.